This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I'm really delighted to represent the campus leadership and welcome you all and David uh, to this really important event. And to be honest, I, um, I have got to leave in about uh, half an hour to get to another event that's concurrent back at Parnassus. So um, I came down in specifically because this event is so important to the campus. Um, uh, the, the whole focus here for the afternoon is to talk about the scientific findings uh, that will allow us to take action related to the extremely um, harmful exposures that are clearly evident that affect our population and have been relatively unnoticed for too long. And this, the reason this is such an exciting moment for UCSF and to have David here is that it's very timely uh, for the population at large all across the globe and here in the United States, but also right here at UCSF. Because as I think everyone can appreciate, I believe that we as an institution are starting to pay more attention, deserve it attention, to the chronic diseases that burden our society. Diseases like diabetes, uh, certain cancers, obesity, and so forth. And uh, as you think about each of these entities, we're realizing that the science, although it's been focused on sort of basic molecular mechanisms for many, many decades, the science is opening our eyes to the fact that it's interaction between basic mechanisms and the external environment that play a key role that we have been missing for too long. So this, this lecture reflects the vision of the UCSF Environmental Health Initiative, which was started last year to address just these, just these aspects of disease, the environmental contribution to disease uh, and the importance of being able to identify and prevent those exposures. And it's a collaborative, uh, as many of you know, and David, you'll probably learn about, uh, is a multidisciplinary network of academics across UCSF who are working together to address this important issue. And the, the lecture today embodies this very initiative, which is uh, to try to get, help us think about the extraordinary breadth of science that exists at UCSF from the most basic uh, aspects of a pro protein structure to population sciences writ large and to figure out how we can better integrate the work that's going on at UCSF to tackle these problems. And it's also really good timing for UCSF because as many of you have probably read, we're just beginning to think about a major capital campaign and the ways that that campaign should have a focus. And I personally will, will say that I think that our efforts for finding resources that enable us to do the work here at UCSF needs to be as inclusive as possible, including thinking about these larger scale uh, environmental and global issues. And then finally, as you know from the agenda for today, not only are you going to hear from one of the world's experts on this topic, um, you're also going to get a chance to do more networking. And this is going to be really key. I was, I, I was delighted to attend a networking event in the fall. Uh, in which I thought I, I could see firsthand just how many potential connections we have here among the UCSF community. We just need to find one another and learn about what we're doing and then figure out how we can actually work together. Um, I'd like to thank the other sponsors of the event, uh, the Research Development Office, the Office of Sustainability, the Philip Lee Institute for Health Policy Sciences, Global Health Sciences, and the Preterm Birth Initiative. And now a pleasure uh, for me to have the opportunity to introduce David G. David's had a career of working at the interface of science and policy making in the fields of occupational health and the environment. He graduated in economics and politics from York University in the UK in 1968. And then he worked for a number of trade unions in the UK and was the director of Friends of the Earth from 1989 to 91. I was reading your bio last night, trying to figure out some of the unions that you work for. They seem very interested. And you must have been in the trenches uh, doing advocacy work at that time. 
He was most recently senior advisor on science policy and emerging, emerging issues at the European Environment Agency in Copenhagen, um, where he led the writing of a series of reports uh, uh, titled Late Lessons from Early Warnings. Um, uh, these uh, writings address the health costs of action and inaction on threats to environmental health. It evaluates a series of historical hazards, such as the Minimata mercury poisoning and leaded gas, as well as emerging, emerging issues, such as EMF radiation from mobile phones and neonicotinoid uh, pesticides. And it provides the lessons learned so we can shorten the time between scientific discovery and action now and in the future. So nothing could be more appropriate for what we aim to accomplish at UCSF. David, welcome to UCSF. Well, thank you very much for that very kind and generous uh, introduction. And thank you to all concerned for uh, getting me here and uh, putting this uh, event together. Um, what I'd like to do is to share some of the detail of some of the case studies uh, from these uh, two reports that we published, uh, the first 2001, called Late Lessons, Early Warnings, the Precautionary Principle 1896 to 2000. And because it was well used in teaching and thereabouts, uh, we were encouraged to produce volume two, which is somewhat bigger than I planned, uh, <laughs> but uh, came out in 2013. And I'd like to see if I can skate over some of the interesting uh, insights and lessons that emerge from these fascinating uh, case studies. I must um, uh, warn you beforehand that sometimes when I get involved in the detail of the case studies, I get quite carried away. So I must make sure that the timing of this is about right. Uh, to talk for about 45, 50 minutes, something like that, if, if I can keep you awake that long. Um, so if I can make this thing work here. So I'm going to, essentially it'll be divided into four sections. Some of the nuggets from the case studies and what's in the reports themselves, some generic insights and lessons, uh, a third section looking at precaution and a sufficiency of evidence for action, and something about the links between precaution and innovation. Uh, these are the two volumes that I just showed you. And this, uh, these are the 34 case studies uh, across uh, both volumes. Uh, you can see that they uh, deal with uh, environmental chemicals, uh, just a few environmental chemicals, but those with an enormous amount of experience and science behind them. And they are, if you like, the tip of the iceberg of the something like 80,000 chemicals that are, are out there in commerce for which we have very little information and for which we need to draw lessons from these well-known ones if we are to avert harm from the new ones. And then this collection of uh, uh, chapters on ecosystems, including the French uh, story about the bee decline, which began in the early 90s uh, in France. Um, three transport fuel additives, a couple of micro technologies as we call them, three radiations, pharmaceuticals, asbestos and animal feed additives. Um, for the most part, the chapters have been written by those who played a key role in the um, history of these events. So the man who writes the chapter on CFCs and the ozone hole is the guy who discovered the hole in the ozone layer, Joe Farman, when he was director of the British Antarctic Survey. And similarly, we approached a lot of other people who have played key roles in either the science or the policy or both of those chapters to, to write the chapter for us. Um, with a simple structure, when was the first really plausible uh, early warning? When did it happen? What did society then do with that information in all its forms, companies, corporations, NGOs, governments? Uh, what were the consequences of the action or inaction at point two? And point four, what can we learn from these case studies that could help us to avert uh, some of the harms whilst maximising innovations? With that knowledge being in the hands of newer generations of people like yourselves who can hopefully make fewer mistakes than perhaps our generations did. In addition, there are eight horizontal chapters, uh, 12 late lessons from volume one, and then a bit more detail in the horizontal chapters of precautionary principle, false positives, precautionary science, and the other uh, uh, chapters that you can see there. All these chapters are available as PDFs, as downloadable from the EEA website, the European Environment Agency. Uh, and although I'm now retired from the agency, I felt that there was sufficient volume of uh, interesting information in those books paid for by European taxpayers that I ought to spend some of my retirement time in disseminating uh, some of the contents, which explains why I'm here today. The first early warnings came very early in many cases. 1896 for climate change, uh, 97 benzene, 98 asbestos. Uh, 
1925 for leaded petrol, 1965 for antibiotics and animal feed, 92-93 for gaucho pesticide and the bee decline story from France, mobile phones, the first epi study in 1999. And the early warnings look a bit like this. 1898, the good factory inspector takes, uh, is a female, a rare female factory inspector in the UK, takes home the fibres to her home, puts them in a microscope and concludes that they are going to do some damage. It was about a hundred years later that Europe finally succeeded in banning asbestos and, and, and in doing so had to win a case at the World Trade Organization where Canada took uh, the European Union and France to the World Trade Organization arguing there was an insufficiency of evidence to justify banning white asbestos. Fortunately, um, Canada lost that case and uh, the asbestos was finally banned. But at enormous cost in terms of both money, uh, cancers, uh, NHS or health services costs, um, um, and in ways which means that had we there's a particularly poignant uh, comment uh, from a factory inspector, chief of the factory inspectors in 1931, where he says, uh, looking back to 1898 and thereabouts, um, and, this, and the subsequent development of the evidence, in 1931 he said, looking back, we really have missed an opportunity to get hold of this uh, uh, huge, hugely harmful agent. Uh, Little was he to know that it would take another another 70 years before uh, society got a grip of that um, agent. One of the key things that helped to, as it were, perpetrate the problem was a generic point, which I want to emphasize here, which is that whenever you get uh, the, uh, the evidence of harm from a long-term latent uh, agent, which takes a number of years, maybe a decade or two, to generate the harm, by the time you get the evidence of the harm, the technological conditions nearly will have nearly always will have changed practically they will have changed sufficiently for people to then say today's evidence of harm is from a previous time and today's conditions are therefore safe and you can't really disprove that except with solid evidence from another 20 year wait which is in effect what happened so here's the first as it were authoritative assertion that yes today's circumstances are clean he said the doctor who found the first uh, of um, a, a clinical case in 1899 and was summoned to this um, event in the British Parliament in 1906 to give his evidence as, a, as the most informed clinician on asbestos at that time. And he, was, he said when asked, well, yes, I think conditions in the factories now are much cleaner than they were when this man had his exposures 20 years ago, and therefore one assumes that it is now a safe um, place to be. A, a classic case of somebody asserting something without really any evidence to back it up. And that continued when we went into the 20, from, from 1929 to 1953 to 1959, the three big steps in the expansion of harm of asbestos. Uh, at each time we got the evidence for these things, it was again possible at each time to say uh, conditions now are much, much cleaner and therefore safe. A problem we face across all long, with all long-term hazards. The leaded petrol story uh, begins where they decide to put in the lead into the petrol in order to produce a fuel that would deal better with the new engines that were just being produced in the early 20s. And because lead was of course well known as a hazard, the Surgeon General uh, writes to General Motors saying, um, is it a good idea to put uh, lead in petrol, do you think? And uh, General Motors writes back with another authoritative but unsubstantiated assertion, saying that we've given it very serious consideration. Uh, we haven't actually got any data on this, but we are convinced that the average street will be so free from lead, it will be impossible to detect it or its absorption. How uh, arrogant that was at the time. There was an opposing point of view. The Surgeon General wasn't impressed with that answer and he called a, a one-day meeting uh, of experts on lead to discuss the issue. And the professor from uh, Yale, Yendel Henderson, uh, said, look, we know enough about lead now to realise that if you do let this compound out into the city streets, um, the development of the poisoning will come on so insidiously that the uh, public and the government uh, will, it will take them a long time to awaken to the situation. 
Um, and of course that long time um, and the nearly universal use was both global use by the time consciousness arose and awakened to the insidious lead poisoning in the streets of cities. Uh, it took 60 years essentially before between that statement and the realisation that the statement was a, a valid and very robust early warning for a, a predictable hazard. The other key point I wanted to bring out of the lead in petrol story is that at the time there was an alternative which would have not have had the same impression on children's brains as lead turned out to have uh, and it was a, a combination of alcohol in petrol which uh, a couple of years earlier the main technical guy for GM Midgley was saying is um, very 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 uh, efficient and has tremendous advantages. He preferred it at that time to lead in petrol. But his bosses got through to him, they got over the point to him that uh, if we allowed, if they used alcohol, it would be a substance that they wouldn't be able to control in quite the same way as they could lead and uh, petrol, which they had a bit of a monopoly of at that time, GM, Standard Oil and DuPont between the three of them. Um, so just a couple of years later, at this famous one day, tri one day trial of, of, uh, of, of lead, um, it was said that uh, now TEL, tetraethyl lead, is the only material available that can bring about these anti-knock results. So the technical options that were available had a wider public debate ensued, were closed off by these very powerful force forces at the time. And those three men at the head of those three companies gave, gave what they described at that meeting the gift of God led in petrol uh, to the whole world uh, before we all finally woke up. A few people did try and compete with Ethel Corporation but they were forced out of competition by underhand means essentially and even though Ethel lost a case uh, in, in, at an antitrust hearing they continued to manage to force out of the marketplace any viable alternative for a long time. The costs of lead in petrol, of course, have been mega. Uh, the main impact being on children, IQ and so on, and adult heart disease. Well, we looked at the figures for this in a chapter in the book called Costs of Inaction. The best available figures available now for Europe are that the annual costs of just the IQ loss on children in terms of lost productivity and lifetime loss of earnings uh, were between 4 and 6% of GDP, a very expensive mistake. Another one that now turning more to the area that affects a lot of you here uh, to do with reproductive health and developmental problems, uh, the pesticide DBCP, which when looked at in the early days of its development in the 19, late 1950s by both Dow and Shell, uh, they were concluding from the animal uh, data that this was not a very good product to put out into the marketplace. Um, uh, one of the people was at a party particularly and uh, he said we've invented a great new birth control device uh, and it's called uh, this new pesticide and we're not so happy about it. But they were gently overridden by the powers that be within the relevant companies and it went into full production for about uh, 20 years without anybody realising what was going on. So essentially what happened, it went into production, um, young workers fit, American workers realised that they were not uh, producing babies, they talked to their wives, they were all cleared, uh, so they said it must be us, they talked to each other and said, well, we think we're probably sterile. Uh, luckily, the unions were very active in those days, 1977, and they had all seven men tested and all of them were extremely uh, infertile. Uh, which at the, in those days did lead to the abolition and the banning of DBCP as a production pesticide in the US. In the US in the 70s you were qu quite progressive, uh, very precautionary in a lot of ways. Uh, things began to go a bit wrong after 1980. Um, but uh, in the uh, uh, production phase it was happily banned but in the uh, use phase it was not and the big companies put a lot of pressure on the government to allow them to still uh, send it somewhere else to be used in the South American banana plantations essentially. So by the time you get to about 2010 we've got something like 16,000 uh, American plantation workers who are also, uh, whose reproductive uh, life is also blighted by this pesticide and lots of compensation cases are still in the pipeline. Although it was banned in uh, 1970 or thereabouts, 77, um, of course it was a persistent uh, 
material. And again, a very early warning in 61 from the relevant scientists doing the work on this said, look, this has got relatively low vapour pressure, high density, and it'll assure a long residence time in the soil. So already the idea of persistence being a, a, a marker for long-term environmental problems was pretty well established. The consequence of not reining it in in the early days, based on those early rat studies in the 50s, was that there are now uh, considerable DBCP water contamination in many water systems in the US, 191 at the last time of, uh, of looking at that particular case study. So some of the lessons of DBCP, another one of authoritative assertions of safety without scientific evidence of safety, the early dismissal of animal studies, reproductive effects occurring without obvious pathology, limited use of medical records and health statistics, skin exposure adding much to air exposure, which was underappreciated, independent risk assessments are clearly needed, uh, effects become adverse eff effects in many situations, and that national safety standards need to be extended to other user countries. The DES pill, uh, again, an, an, another example of a reproductive problem. Uh, again, early evidence from 1933 to 1948 of carcinogenicity, developmental effects, reproductive effects, uh, and even by 1952, a study done on its efficacy, showing actually it does not work as a pregnancy pill to help with uh, early pregnancies. But it was nevertheless still pursued as a, a popular pill for women and pushed by the relevant pharmaceutical companies uh, until, again, a, a, a lucky cluster in many ways. Um, had it not been a rare cancer and had it not been uh, tested around Boston such that the first cases appeared in one major hospital, uh, the seven cases of vaginal cancer in the daughters when they were in their late 20s would not have appeared in such a, a, an obvious way if it had been another tumour and, and rolled out in a, a broader way to, to begin with. Uh, that too led to a ban in 1971. But this is one of those key cases where the long-term transgenerational effects have been truly awful. Uh, when the Shana Swan wrote the chapter for us in volume one, uh, already the evidence of uh, vaginal cancer in the young daughters, late 20s, was pretty obvious. Um, and just the beginnings of perhaps mid-life problems with reproduction. But by the time we get her to write uh, an update in 2013 volume to say what's happened to the evidence on DES, uh, she finds that the impacts of the prenatal exposures are much worse than we feared, even in the year 2000, over that short time period. Uh, lifelong reproductive harm occurred to the daughters who survived the cancers, to many of them. Increased risks of breast cancer beginning to appear as, the, as those women age. Uh, evidence of te uh, testicular harm in the sons. And now the beginnings of early elevation of birth defects in male and female grandchildren. So a truly transgenerational impact, which is drawing attention to the problem of fetal toxicity uh, not only causing uh, immediate effects in the offspring, but also transgenerational effects and uh, late effects uh, in, in late chronic effects later on in life. Some of the key conclusions there were, for all those synthetic oestrogens that are now on the market, like BPA, uh, we must heed the lessons of DES and be extremely careful in exposing pregnant women to any uh, endocrine disrupting substance that no evidence of harm is not evidence of no harm, I'll return to that point, and that the absence of long-term pre-market testing for reproductive outcomes uh, and the ignorance or the uh, not heeding of early warnings uh, was something that contributed greatly to that disaster. The regulatory agencies uh, were semi-captured for most of those years uh, and didn't act as quickly as they should have done. PCB story is a, an example mainly of how a persistence, bioaccumulation and large spatial range uh, can cause widespread and enduring contamination long after the ban. Some of you will remember the story of PCBs which really began as a, a wildlife problem. The original evidence was in workers in the 1930s and 1940s, liver damage and other effects in workers that was ignored. And then the harm emerges as a wildlife problem in seabirds, sea eagles and so on, both in the US and in Sweden. Um, a beginnings of a ban in about 1966 for those wildlife reasons, uh, tightening up gradually following that. But then the realisation that the the genie was well out of the bottle and that we're now getting effects of PCBs through to a next generation of infants who are 
receiving their dose from the pregnant mother and through their breast milk. Uh, a classic case of how uh, a persistent product will cause transgenerational effects. And the authors conclude in that chapter, as in most of the chapters, that the wider application of the precautionary principle would have saved at least part of the, this uh, legacy of wildlife and human damage. Uh, the CFC story in some ways, uh, and the ozone layer, is a bit more positive in the sense that action was taken once the hole was discovered in 1985. Uh, had it been taken when the two guys who got the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1974, who said CFCs will drift up to the stratosphere and will put a hole in the ozone layer, which will allow extra radiations to come through, which will cause skin cancers, cataracts and crop damage, um, that was ignored until we had evidence of the actual hole itself. Thereafter, action was pretty speedy. The Global Montreal Protocol, two years later, led to its eventual uh, phase-out. But Joe Farman, who discovered the hole, his conclusion was that we should not allow these grand global experiments with large um, uh, tonnage chemicals which haven't been adequately pre-market tested. Um, uh, all too often the technology will outstrip the science needed to assess the risks. And we must ask policymakers to move from a position of ignorance where nothing is known to rudimentary understanding when a sufficiency of evidence will justify action in some of these, uh, some of these cases. Just switching to a, an ecosystem for a, a, a moment, uh, the Canadian cod collapse was a, is a big feature in the, in the fish stocks chapter in, in volume one. Uh, and here again, uh, a very clear early warning was issued uh, in 1985. Uh, by scientists who realised that they were, the whole area was being overfished and it was quite liable to collapse. But notice the language with which it was dismissed by the Canadian Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Uh, they, they dismissed it as biased pseudoscience written to support a political agenda. Uh, one begins to realise that if you see that sort of language uh, being used to dismiss an early warning, uh, it usually means they're on weak ground scientifically because you don't need to resort to that kind of personal attacks if your science is, is sound enough. So the early warning was ignored and the fish stock collapsed uh, in 92 uh, and it has never really significantly recovered. Loss of 60,000 jobs and uh, loss of a whole ecosystem. With the Fukushima chapter in Volume 2, looking at the lessons from Chernobyl and Fukushima, um, the issue I wanted to draw out was this assumptions of safety being based upon models and narrow risk assessments which pretend to have covered for all eventualities and can safely deliver verdicts like that one in 2006 which was still the current guidance when Fukushima uh, had its accident in 2011 where they have concluded by a probabilistic risk assessment and um, accident by design approaches, they have concluded that sealed containment structures would prevent damage from a tsunami and no hazard would at all be likely. After the event, the investigation committee got to the heart of that point and said, basically, we are not, uh, we, we, one of the key lessons is to design our systems so that they are able to cope with incidents beyond the basic assumptions of engineers uh, doing uh, probabilistic risk assessment. Turning now to the bee uh, story from France, uh, which begins with beekeepers noticing that the, the bees are just not coming back to the hives, they are dying early, they are not producing honey, and the beekeepers are really puzzled by this because it hasn't happened before, mortalities are up. So they talk to each other and uh, first of course they blame themselves, being professional beekeepers, they think we are you know, keeping our hives wrongly or something. But they talk to each other and find that it's a generic problem in this region of France. They then talk to the farmers and the farmers say, oh, we had a new pesticide introduced last year, a neonicotinoid systemic pesticide, that instead of uh, spraying the fields, we put it into the ground and it grows up with the plant. So the beekeepers said, oh, well, wait a minute, if it grows up with the plant, uh, perhaps it'll end up in the pollen and that's where my bees go and they could well be picking up this, uh, this neonicotinoid pesticide. So they start going down that track, trying to find out the risk assessment, trying to find out the evidence from the companies. Um, and the story goes on um, uh, in terms of uh, success of the uh, campaign eventually. They managed to get the neonicotinoids banned in 1999 using the precaution principle in France and then on a wider area of acreage to do with maize in 2004. Um, 
along the way, it turns out that the initial risk assessments performed were of this sort, i.e. wrong risk regime. Um, they just extrapolated from the old technology of spraying a risk assessment regime that was not updated to cope with the new, very different sort of technology embodied in the systemic pesticide. Low exposures, of course, uh, were ex uh, just assumed to be safe. Um, the whole uh, uh, focus was on acute effects rather than sublethal and chronic effects. The systemic effects that happen within honeybee uh, uh, hives, um, which are not predictable from the behaviour of just one or two bees themselves, those were also systematically ignored, as was the overall multi-causality and complexity of the situation. No representation of beekeepers and relevant researchers. That's a key feature of many of these risk assessments. The numbers of disciplines involved is usually very narrow and they just uh, focus in on one aspect that they are very familiar with and the cross-disciplinarity that you need for these risk assessment committees is usually not uh, available. Some insights and general lessons uh, overall in a more generic sense. Um, Volume 1 finished with 12 late lessons, and there are five of them here I just wanted to pick out. The humility required of scientists to acknowledge that there is a great deal that we don't know, a lot of uncertainties, and there are whole areas of ignorance out there that we have not yet tapped into, is something that was remarkably absent from all of the case studies. Instead, scientists were very arrogant in their assumptions about what they knew, and the whole focus was on the things that they knew that predicted X, Y, and Z, rather than stepping back and saying, well, actually, there are whole areas of ignorance and uncertainty out there that we're not familiar with, um, and that would have helped them to foresee some of the problems that arose. Um, almost complete lack of adequate research, pre, you know, pre-market research, research done at the right time, that is, and long-term monitoring. Real-world conditions ignored, uh, assumptions and values of key uh, interest groups generally assumed away or certainly not transparent or ignored. And in a more positive sense, the idea is to say that because from ignorance that we is always present, of course, there will always be scientific surprises and consequences that we could not foresee, adapting an array of technologies or means of meeting our needs rather than the monopolistic ones that we had with asbestos, PCBs, lead in petrol and um, uh, benzene, for example, whereby the need is met essentially by a global product. So if things go badly wrong, then you have a global problem on your hands. Therefore, the message is go for a diversity of robust and flexible and adaptable technologies and products such that if there is a big surprise coming along the way with any one of them, it won't have the same devastating effect it had from these case study uh, examples. Um, this is just some of the examples of the uh, lesson to do with account for the real world in the MTBE case study. The reality of leaking tanks was just not appreciated. In BSC, the slaughterhouse practices were ignored. In asbestos, controlled use was actually misuse. Um, simplistic models are a feature of many of the case studies, as well as the fish one. And sensitive subgroups, which came out of the beef hormones case study, is a feature of uh, practically all of the environmental health uh, case studies. And now two or three or four um, generalizations based on the well-studied agents that have been produced in large quantities, have been persistent either in production or in um, uh, ecology and biology, and have been well-studied. And three or four generalizations stand out very strongly. Firstly, the exposures that people thought they were dealing with at the beginning of all of these case studies always expand to beyond where they think the problem is. So whatever, at whatever point in time you look at these case studies and see what they were concerned about in terms of exposures, they always started off very narrow, thinking the problem is like this, and in all cases the exposures expanded to uh, other generations, to environments, to families, to broad communities, much more broadly um, uh, than they had envisaged. So exposures always expand with time. Secondly, the nature of the harm that people were concerned about at the beginning of each of the case studies was again narrow, but as, with ti as time went on, that harm always expanded to, for, from beyond the initial concern, let's say asbestosis with asbestos, to mesothelioma with asbestos, and with uh, DES daughters from originally vaginal cancer to long-term uh, breast cancer problems and uh, reprodu reproductive harm in their sons. So the harm also uh, expands. 
And thirdly, the level at which the agent causes the harm always comes down. It never goes the other way. So we think that asbestos at this level, or DES at that level, or uh, PCBs at that level, or radiations at that level, is not harmful. And we always have to recalibrate that level, and it always goes down. It never goes the other way. So three robust generalizations from history enable us to deal with uh, current problems and, be, uh, uh, and make us aware of the likelihood of what could well happen if we allow something out in a large production format without, in a, without adequate pre-market testing. The harm is likely to expand, the exposures will expand, and the so-called safe level, the so-called exposure limit, will come down. Conversely, of course, when you do finally take action, you can actually expand the range of benefits that you thought you were getting. So when TFCs were controlled for the ozone hole, we got a big secondary benefit because it later turned out that they were also greenhouse gases, and so the reduction in CFCs gave us a bit of a bonus on reduced greenhouse gases. And the TBT effects that we thought were localised turned out to be global effects, so the global ban um, was much more beneficial than we thought it would ever be. The action on PCBs that was finally taken on wildlife, of course, gave us some later health benefits because the exposures were less than if we had not banned PCBs for those wildlife benefits. And, of course, reducing lead in petrol and removing lead to a certain extent from urban environments has a beneficial effect on adult heart disease as well as children's IQ. Surprises will always come from the knowledge base. Uh, so we go from vertical uh, transferability to uh, horizontal transferability in the antibiotic case study. And we go from scraper in sheep to uh, CJD in humans in the BSE case study. We go from probabilistic risk assessments with their limitations that I've mentioned to incidents beyond assumptions in Fukushima. And we go from placental protection, which we thought was the case prior to the Minamata Bay disaster in the 50s, to fetal toxicity and to the lifelong implantation of chronic diseases at the fetal stage of life, which emerges from the Minamata case study. Science becomes more complex, from toxicology to endocrinology, from linear res dose response to non-linear dose response, from smooth transitions sometimes to abrupt tipping points, from dose makes the poison to timing of the dose makes the poison, and from single to multiple causality. The last point is a generic one which stands out very strongly. The days of the 1950s when we thought we had A causes B uh, in a very simple way, like tobacco causes lung cancer, um, we now know is a, a, an age that has largely gone by. We're now in the era of multi-causality, ecological public health, lots of environmental um, agents acting at different times and in different places on different su susceptible subgroups, to either uh, operate through an epigenetic pathway or more direct pathways to cause disease in some populations at some point in time. Perhaps the best illustration that comes out of the case studies about uh, the difference between single and multiple causality comes out of the B case study, where at the heart of the controversy uh, when they had already banned gaucho, it was called, from uh, maize, and the French government was looking at, should we ban it now in, um, sorry, it was banned first in sunflowers, and then they were looking at, should they ban it in the much wider area of maize, and they set up the um, French Commission for Toxic Products, a standing committee, to have a look at this question. And th their conclusion illustrates this naive striving for a single cause that could explain everything. And the words they use sums it up. First of all, the risk assessment does not allow us to demonstrate, that's a very high level of proof to begin with, that the maize seed dressing with the gaucho neonicotinoid can be solely responsible at national level for all losses, behavioural troubles, mortalities and general decline in honey production. That really is striving after a most unrealistic single causal model of reality out there. Fortunately, it was recognised as grossly deficient in that way, and they were replaced by um, a more nuanced, more multidisciplinary, more um, aware of the systemic effects that they were dealing with and the complex systems that they were dealing with, group called the Multifactor Study of Honeybee Colonies. And more within a year, are you looking at the same data and the same uh, evidence, their conclu conclusion was much more in line with this more nuanced multi-causal paradigm, if you like. They said, we are concerned about gaucho. 
Notice, of course, a lower level of proof here from demonstrating harm to concern about plausible possible harm um, because it is one of the explanatory elements for the weakening of the bee population, probably through an immune uh, system uh, mechanism, observed despite the ban of gaucho on sunflowers. And that more um, nuanced um, multi-causal explanation for why they should be concerned about gaucho was sufficient for the French Minister of Agriculture to ban gaucho on uh, maize, uh, having received that report. But that, I spend a little time on that because that really is a key uh, issue that emerges out of these case studies, the move from simple single causality to multi-causality and the implications it has for uh, evidence and action. One implication is expect inconsistency from complexity. Uh, as stressed by the authors of the bee chapter there, the complexity of environmental factors and of bee colonies means that the same conditions can never be fully reproduced. Uh, it's very difficult to get average uh, conditions for highly complex systems. So one needs to perhaps just downplay the weight that it was hitherto put on the consistency of research results. A conclusion that uh, Herbie Needleman, who was the most famous uh, scientist, I think, out of the lead in petrol story, who produced the first convincing evidence of IQ losses in children exposed to lead in petrol, through a brilliant uh, piece of work using the teeth of, of, of young, baby, young, young, young uh, toddlers, um, reflecting on the science that he'd been dealing with all that time, uh, some 10, 15 years later, Needleman also concludes from the field of environmental health that consistency in nature doesn't require that all or even a majority of studies find the same effect. If all studies of lead showed the same relationship between variables, one would be startled, perhaps even justifiably suspicious because of the huge variation in the, in the circumstances of a multi-causal complex phenomena that occurs whenever you try and replicate. Of course, one must try and replicate. One still searches for consistency, but one doesn't put consistency of results at the same high level of value as one did before we became aware of complexity and multi-causality. It also follows that no evidence of harm, as I mentioned before, is not the same as evidence of no harm, although it can be very convincing. If you're on television with a white hair and a professorship and you say there is no evidence of harm of X, it sounds like you've got evidence that there is no harm. Usually it means the studies haven't been done and I'm saying there's no evidence of harm, which is not quite the same. Uh, and that issue, that statement, that ability to, as it were, turn no evidence of harm into evidence of no harm uh, was throughout many of the case studies. In order to get a handle on to what extent we are now following one of the lessons from Volume 1, which is are we doing any anticipatory research at the same time as rolling out new technologies, we did a quick analysis of the um, EU public research programme from 1994 to 2013 in the three areas of nanotech, biotech and information tech. And we just looked at what amount of money was being spent to develop the technology, the middle column, and what about what was being spent to anticipate possible hazards from these technologies. And we discovered that a remarkably small amount of money was being put aside to anticipate hazards. Which, which reflects, of course, many of the historical case studies where the research only got underway, really, once the evidence of harm became, as it were, unavoidable. Uh, so the lesson about how can we maybe anticipate hazards of new technologies and products by doing anticipatory research, which would also help to prolong the life of the technologies, because not doing uh, a significant amount of research in, for example, nanotech, which is looking as though it could be a very useful technology and is already being so, is quite likely to lead to a position where we do find a problem that we could have uncovered with maybe 15% of a research budget going on anticipating hazards, and that would have helped prolong the life of the technology. Because once harm hits in a big way, it usually shortens the life of the technology very quickly. So anticipatory research at the right level uh, could both uh, help prolong the life of useful technologies as well as avoid harm to people and planet. Um, what that figure should be uh, is a political, debatable, public discussion question. Um, it's just often not put. These figures that we have on the right-hand side are not the result of Europe sitting down and saying we'll spend 2%. They are the result of um, a system of hundreds of committees look looking at thousands of projects and coming to individualistic conclusions, and that's an emergent property of a complex system. 
when perhaps it should be a democratic outcome. Uh, since doing these talks in various countries, I, the only country I've come across so far that has taken the, on board this point has uh, been the, uh, the Netherlands, where they had a parliamentary debate about the research budget for nanotech and decided that 15% of the budget would be an appropriate, as it were, insurance premium to spend on anticipatory research in order to prolong the life of the technology. When we looked at some of the chemical issues, we found that there was a, a similar problem of what we call scientific inertia. We looked at 78 environmental health journals over a 100-year period uh, and focused a lot on the year since 2000 when we first produced Volume 1. And we found that 15,000 articles were published on just lead, mercury and DDT, substances that were largely uh, either phased out or were being phased out and where we already knew a tremendous amount. Whereas on a list of 13 emerging large production chemicals identified by the US EPA, there were only 352 on eight of them and none at all on the other, the other seven. Some reasons for that are to be debated, uh, but uh, they include things like professors uh, knowing and loving the subject that they've studied for the last 50 years, the machinery in the laboratory being geared, geared up to those particularly well-known subjects, um, people realising they can get uh, papers easily published in these traditional areas with a marginal improvement in knowledge, and, and, and other forces that seem to explain this scientific inertia. Whether we can do much about that or not is up to uh, universities like, like yours. Some broad lessons from Volume 2. Much more weight needs to be given to natural, human and social capitals rather than finance and economic capital by using more widely precaution, polluter pays, etc. Acknowledging and dealing with complexity and multicausality, using lower strengths of evidence for precautionary action, uh, embracing knowledge that comes not from science, uh, because many of the case studies show that lay, local, traditional, uh, professional uh, beekeepers, fishers, um, citizens, workers, they often generate knowledge in advance of the science that we need to perhaps put more weight on. More transparent risk assessments and more effective, adaptable, participatory and cooperative systems or cooperative systems of governing innovation. I'll quickly go on to the precaution principle in the last section. The PP really has two roles. One, it helps to raise a debate, as in point one, about the thing we are discussing, GM or uh, nuclear energy or um, uh, you know, antimicrobials or whatever, um, do th are they essential for our needs? Before we go down the risk assessment road, um, are we picking up the right kind of innovation to address our needs? Uh, so as in the case of GM, there's a debate to be had about agroecological farming versus GM. One's a very top-down approach, one's a bottom-up approach. Uh, the agroecological approach embraces not just food production, but CO CO2 absorption, soil conservation, water retention, and a whole host of other things to do with agriculture, uh, whereas a top-down uh, GM seed approach tends to narrow the focus onto food production only. And of course it's controlled by uh, patents and other forms, whereas agroecology, uh, the local knowledge of farmers is utilised to its maximum. And when the big international studies have been done, it does show that there is more relevance to most farmers going down an agroecological route than to just GM seed, which will have its place, but perhaps much smaller than it is envisaged by those companies promoting it. That's all discussed in the, the GM chapter. But the other function of the PP is to say that it provides a legal and moral justification for action on levels of evidence that would normally not be regarded as sufficient. Um, the working definition that we use to try and get a broader debate about the PP is based on those ones that exist in lots of international agreements and member states and the EU and so on. Uh, because the EU itself doesn't define it, uh, we have put this forward to illustrate the, the issues that it, it covers. It's used in complexity and uncertainty and ignorance in those situations. If you haven't got that, if you've got relative simplicity, then uh, risk assessment where you know the probabilities, you know the harm, then prevention is the principle to use. So it's here in order to help cope with a lot of unknowns. And it uses an appropriate strength of evidence to justify taking action, having looked at the pros and cons, that's quantifiable and non-quantifiable, of actions and inactions, to the extent that we have got knowledge at that point. So it reflects a variable strength of evidence in a case-specific way. 
for example, we can go from beyond all reasonable doubt of scientific causality in criminal law to the bottom of pertinent information, which is all that's required at the WTO level under the SPS agreement justifying member state actions to protect health. And in between, a whole range of different kinds, different strengths of evidence that are deemed reasonable for certain circumstances. Uh, they all have their place, and the question is, which would we use in the particular case study that we are looking at? It's a question of who gains and who benefits from being wrong, essentially, in acting or not acting. So it's a, a humble kind of question uh, which needs to be addressed. Uh, as we prefer to allow a murderer to go free who has not established, because we have not established, beyond all reasonable doubt strength of evidence, uh, we'd rather have that cost of being wrong than to convict an innocent person. So we use a high level of proof, high strength of evidence in the criminal courts for those reasons of being more comfortable with a mistake in one direction than in another. In the case of environmental health and environmental agents, the question is who gets the benefit of the doubt, the agents themselves or the people at risk, and what strength of evidence do we use? In his famous paper uh, by Sir Austin Bradford Hill on association or causation in 1965, uh, he uh, said, when it comes to the case for action, which is the last part of his paper, he said relatively slight evidence would be sufficient to justify banning a pill, that, uh, a pregnancy pill, that seemed to be causing some um, uh, harmful effects in just a few rats. We wouldn't really want to wait for much longer if out there millions of women were being exposed. And if we were wrong, and it turns out that that pill uh, was quite harmless, then the cost of being wrong is relatively little compared to waiting for more evidence beyond the slight evidence he described to perhaps very strong evidence, uh, by which time, of course, that evidence usually has to constitute the very harm that you're trying to prevent. So he introduced the idea of differential standards before we take action, which is reflected uh, in, in that previous table uh, there. Finally, when you do use the precautionary principle, of course, it stimulates innovation. When you look at all the monopolies that we had in lead, in BSC, in um, PCBs and uh, benzene and CFCs and so on, they were in the marketplace for a long time holding out uh, innovative substitutes because there wasn't the market pressure for that. When you use the precautionary principle, therefore, you bring forward by a decade or two or three uh, the innovatory effects of regulations and other means of dealing with agents like harmful, like taxes, fees and tra tradable permits. So it brings forward, in the first point, uh, the innovations. Uh, it stimulates debates on what kind of options uh, should we be addressing and it avoids the billions in damage costs that we have seen in all of the case studies. When you look at uh, the research on regulations, they do stimulate innovation. A recent report uh, out of Europe clearly shows that, as does uh, earlier work from Ashford at MIT and Porter from Harvard Business School, both of whom emphasise the importance of uh, well-designed regulations, changing markets and increasing and uh, stimulating innovation. A recent review of OECD came to the same conclusion. Even stringent environmental regulations do not harm productivity. Coming to a, a close, uh, looking just briefly at the endocrine disrupting chemical story, which is now much broader than those case studies that we looked at where reproductive and developmental harm was clear, like uh, PCBs, DDT, DDT uh, D, B, DBCP, uh, and DES, um, we currently have plausible evidence of delayed and serious impacts that is now available. The complexity and multicausality that is in play does delay the arrival of very strong uh, levels of proof of harm. Therefore, we re action, if it's going to prevent harm, must be taken at lower strengths of evidence, justified by the precautionary principle, uh, bearing in mind the tragedies uh, that we have uh, studied. Many barriers to action, from unsupported assertions of safety, inadequate research, uh, failure to acknowledge uncertainties and ignorance, and conservative science. Science is designed to not produce a false positive more than it is designed to produce false negatives. So science leans over to not find harmful agents uh, to, the extent that, uh, to the extent that it can, uh, and it, its bias of most of its methods is in not establishing false knowledge, i.e. false positives it inevitably means that it's biased against uh, 
finding early evidence of uh, actual harm. So we need to look at perhaps some of the methods that we're using to see to what extent we could perhaps reverse, not reverse, but rebalance the ability of science to generate false positives and false negatives. From the policy side, uh, lots of conflicts over uh, risk assessments, particularly intransparent ones, market failures, the costs of harm, all the harms that we've mentioned are usually not borne by the creators of the harm. They are externalised onto victims and societies uh, where there is no incentive, therefore, on the, on the creator of the harm to reduce it early on because the harm is externalised, as the economists put it. So we need to work out how to internalise costs of harm as harm begins to emerge. Um, the manufacturing of doubt by corporations, the capture of regulators, short-termism in general, the fact that losers mobilise and gainers don't, so anybody who's about to lose a product does mobilise politically, and the society which will gain from that loss of that product overall does not even, is not usually aware and therefore does not mobilise. And willful blindness is a feature. Some, I can't finish without mentioning this wonderful navigation guide, which has reverberated around Europe, which comes out of this department here, which is trying to make just more transparent and more systematic the evaluation of harmful agents in order to minimise the conflict between poorly done and intransparent studies and to accelerate the pace with which we arrive at a, an actionable evidence quantity uh, that justifies uh, taking action earlier than before and uh, it's very encouraging to see how these sorts of methods um, are being taken up. I'll just skip past that, it's all about internalisation of environmental and health costs so that, well the last point is worth emphasising, uh, a key issue would be to say that as an agent begins to develop some evidence of harm, you put a small fee on its use, its continued use, the revenues of which then go into green chemistry and innovation to phase out that particular agent, which is being done in Massachusetts through the Toxic Use Reduction Act and was done across the whole of the US uh, as a mean, uh, during the history of phasing out CFCs. So the idea of internalizing costs of harm as the harm emerges and using the revenues via fees to, just, to fund uh, innovation uh, is a very compelling idea. And the final point is that so many of the case studies reflected a relative absence of public engagement. Some of them did exhibit, of course, the active uh, role that NGOs have played, NRDC, in many of the cases here in the US, for example. So NGOs have played a very positive role and have often led to the action that was necessary. But it, when you look at the full sweep of the histories, it's a minor role. And we therefore conclude by saying, we ought to explore the ways in which we can have much greater public involvement in both research directions, innovation directions, and choosing uh, innovative pathways to the future for energy and food and so on, and the big questions of innovations, as well as looking in more detail at the strengths of evidence that they find acceptable to take action on in order to avoid harm. Um, we've no magic bullets as to how to get this greater public engagement, but there are lots of experiments now going on, in, both in the fields of responsible innovation and uh, more inclusive research agendas being set by NIEHS, for example, that illustrate some of the values of doing this. I'll conclude there and say thank you very much for being so patient and listening to such a, a lot of quite varied stuff in a short space of time, and I hope that at least some of you will have got something out of it to help you and your generations make fewer mistakes than we've made. Thank you very much.